Amen. So I'm just going to read Acts chapter um, uh, 2. And um, we're, we're going to finish the message we started um, on power from on high. And um, please feel free to read along with me. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all those who speak Galileans and how is it that we each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pyrigia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, Visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So again, the gospel is for the Arabs as well as for the Jews as well as for the, uh, every other race. And we uh, because this is a day I, I believe Jesus is coming back, and He wants the world to know Him. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So they're all amazed and perplexing to one another. Whatever could this mean? Others mocking said they're full of new wine. But Peter standing up with the 11 raised his voice and said to the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, He is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. More of my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the way of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit in his throne. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out that which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says, Uh, But he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Maybe the reason why we're not seeing people being convicted is because we're not convicted. Peter gives them the message in a very blunt, straightforward manner. And it says they were cut to the heart. And how I long to see that in my generation. So many times I stand at the street and I'll preach. And I'll see people walking by laughing or mocking. Or looking at you with a mixture of derision and pity. Or anger. This is a generation that has become so desensitized to eternal things, and I would even include some of the church in that. 
I believe the church of Jesus Christ needs to be awakened. Jesus is coming back. We need to get our lives together. We need to get about uh, the master's business. It says they were cut to the heart. For me, that is what revival is. Men and women who are cut to the heart. And uh, Peter said to them when they said, what shall we do? Peter said, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided among, them all, among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily, with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Lord, I just pray today in Jesus' name that you would quicken your word, you would enable me to proclaim your word in power. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Praise God. So power from on high, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There, I know that's a lengthy passage, uh, chapter 2, but there are a number of things that we see in this, I believe, about the New Testament church. Firstly, it was multinational. And um, I had been thinking of multicultural, but in reality, um, multiculturalism doesn't work. And, and you know, we're seeing that in many uh, European uh, nations. Uh, but uh, the, the church wasn't multicultural, it was multinational. This is a multinational church, it's not a multicultural church. We've one culture, that's the culture of heaven. It's not the culture of Ireland, culture of the Philippines, the culture of Romania, Poland, or South America, or anywhere else. It's the culture of heaven. There, there is a culture that is higher than our culture. It doesn't mean we despise our national culture, it just means there's something that is higher, something that transcends where we came from, and that is the culture of heaven. And so firstly, it was a multinational um, uh, church. They had the ability to reach and unite um, other races because here are a list of all these different nationalities and all of them heard the message, you know, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, Cyrene, Rome. So, you know, you have Europe, you have, you have uh, Africa, you have, um, uh, you know, various parts of the world where, uh, uh, you know, they're hearing the message message. And so the ability to, to reach and unite other races. It's interesting that at Babel, uh, the tongues were mixed, um, were, uh, you know, and, and mankind was thus divided. And yet, at Pentecost, they were united. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit enabling us to minister and communicate effectively. The second thing we see about the New Testament church was power. As Acts chapter 1 shows, they were a prayerful church, and consequently, they were a powerful church. Signs and wonders and miracles were done in the name of Jesus. Over 3,000 people saved after just one altar call. Thirdly, boldness. Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Amen. And so the same disciples who only days earlier had fled in fear were now restored and uh, full of boldness. Peter was bold and fearless. And he calls the people to repentance and salvation. And um, Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, perceived their uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Yes, they had been with Jesus, but they'd also been filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, um, uh, boldness. Uh, fourthly, we see unity. They were supernaturally united by prayer um, because Acts chapter 1 talks about it was a praying church. That's why it was a powerful church. But um, again, we see unity. They were supernaturally united by prayer and the Holy Spirit working together for the eternal purposes of God. Um, because the Bible says we are workers together with him, 2 Corinthians 6, 1. Um, so, but this is the thing. We're not only workers together with him, we're workers together with each other. Amen? And, but in order for us to work with each other, we have to have humility. Pride always gets in the way of people working together. And Satan is the one who comes in with pride because he wants to divide and conquer. Um, Jesus said a house divided against itself will fall. And so the fifth thing is generosity. 
The disciples gave generously to the work of God. We see that in verse 44 and 45. It says, now all who had t- they believed t- they had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods and divided among all as anyone had need. And no, uh, as some people claim, this isn't you know, a, a, a biblical grounds for communism. Um, <laughs> communism is people come, they steal what you have and um, you know, it's, it's a race to the bottom. But here, there was a supernatural outpouring of generosity, amen? And so, uh, anyway, the disciples gave generously to the work of God. Sixthly, community. Um, the Bible says meeting together in the temple and in homes. And so, you know, you have the big meetings and you have the small meetings. And I think they're both important. And, um, and certainly in the series I'm gonna be doing soon with regards to, uh, you know, connect groups, we're gonna be encouraging you to, to join one so that because we need community and we need, uh, you, you know, to, uh, we don't do this on our own, amen? We, we go through life as, as the family of God. And um, so meeting in the temple courts and in homes, but you know, these were all wonderful aspects of what God was doing in the early church, but we know what preceded all of these things and that is Acts chapter two and verse four where it says, um, uh, then there appeared to divide the tongues as a fire set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And um, so many argue about the what of tongues uh, without ever considering the why. Acts chapter one, verse eight, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes on you, and you shall be witnesses to me. And so when you look at the Church of Jesus Christ and all of its diversity and various manifestations, irrespective of you know, nationality, denomination, location, size, you're forced to acknowledge that something is missing. When you compare the church of today to the early Christian church, there was a vibrancy, an excitement, and a power that you don't see today. You know, miracles, signs, and wonders. But most importantly, their impact on society. Acts chapter 17, verse six. These men who have come here who have turned the world upside down. So God wants to use us to bring change to our society. That's why I don't buy into the, you know, the spineless ministers who try to say, well, I don't go there, I'm not political. No, uh, that's just cowardice. We are called to speak into our society. We're called to be salt. We're called to be light. If you turn the lights off, which I believe, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said the church is the conscience of the state. And so if the church is silent, the conscience is silent. And that's why when you see somebody who has a seared conscience, they can do terrible things. And so, you know, is it any surprise that we have abortion on demand in many nations? You know, that we have thousands of little babies aborted in this nation every year. Do we have all of the sin and depravity and confusion when the church is afraid to speak about anything out of fear of being political? It's not being political, it's being biblical. It's being moral. And it's, it's about the proclamation of truth. And yes, truth will offend. I'm fine with that. If the truth offends you, you walk out mad, so be it. That's between you and God. It's not between you and me. It's between you and God. These people who have turned the world upside down, but exactly how did they turn the world upside down? Armies, wealth, influence, marketing. I mean, social media, cool music, trendy pastors and life-affirming messages. No, they did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah chapter uh, four and verse six, so he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord, says Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord's of hosts. So uh, too often it seems like the church has submitted natural wisdom, ability, and effort for the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why we need to get back to the book of Acts. It doesn't mean that you know, uh, we can't use our intelligence or be organized. It just means that organization and advertising is no substitution for the anointing. Acts chapter one and verse one, it says, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus both began to do and teach. All that Jesus began to do, he wants to continue through you and me, amen? See, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, we can be a book of Acts, New Testament church, if we want to, but we will not be a New Testament church without praying in tongues. 
Amen. We'll not be, i.e., as in a book of Acts, I, I understand not saying somebody isn't a Christian or somebody isn't, a, you know, a church isn't a church if they don't pray in tongues. That's completely their choice, absolutely. But we, we cannot see the power and the miracles and the signs and the wonders and the influence um, that the early church saw without the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that absolutely. Because if the book of Acts is our blueprint, and it is, um, then we will see that while the church was born, when the spear was put in Christ's side and blood and water came out, the, 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 the church was born when that happened, and yet the church was empowered when the spirit was poured out, and believers were, were, were viewed as um, incomplete, or at least ill-equipped without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to show you uh, this, because there's many Bible verses um, that acknowledge this. Uh, Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, and it says, uh, but when they believed uh, Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. And um, then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. So, baptism is a part of becoming a believer. If you've never been baptized, next, next Sunday morning, praise the Lord, uh, uh, come yeah. and, um, and, and be baptized. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Um, for as yet, he had fallen upon none of them. And um, they'd only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So we see that the early church saw that it wasn't enough to just simply get saved. You had to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And um, Acts chapter 9 and verse 17. And uh, it says, And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying in his hands on him. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Saul had just encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. He had met Jesus. He, he was saved. What I find fascinating is that wasn't enough. It wasn't enough that he had, he had encountered Jesus physically. I mean, what a privilege. People talk about their testimony, how they came to Christ. You know, Paul came to Christ. I mean, people talk about, you know, this person led me to Christ. I've, Paul was led to Christ by Christ. I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive to have on your resume. And yet, Jesus sends um, a no-name disciple called Ananias so that Saul can receive the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19, verse 1 to 3. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So he said, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, and what you were baptized then? Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying the people should believe in him who would come after him, that is on Christ. When he had said this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they, were, they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And I encourage you, don't check out um, uh, today if you haven't been baptized with the Holy Spirit, because we're going to open the altars. God's going to baptize you with the power of God. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. So based on these verses, clearly the, this experience was vi viewed as essential by the early church. Paul, the man God used to write ha over half the New Testament, said in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 18, I thank my God that I speak in tongues more than you all. So if it mattered to them, it should matter to us. Acts chapter 10, verse uh, 34, and um, here we see um, uh, when Paul went to... Uh, not Paul, sorry, Peter, was sent by God. Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. 
And we're witnesses of all things which he did in the land of Jews in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it was he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking the, these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out into Gentiles, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Had these Gentiles ever heard tongues before? No. And yet, when they believed and accepted Christ as their savior, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they started praying in other tongues. And Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and they asked them to stay a few days. I mean, Peter, as, as, a, uh, you know, an, as an observant Jew, had to have a vision from the Lord to show him he could even go into a Gentile's house. And, um, uh, you know, one, one, one way you can understand the Old Testament in, in, in a better manner, particularly Leviticus and these others, is understanding that God called the Jewish people to be separate. And, um, and, 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 and that's why, again, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't stand with the Jewish people and, and the people of Israel because I have loads of Jewish buddies. I, I don't. I mean, because they took, you know, the calling of God very, very seriously. And to this day, you know, many observant Jews are, are, are very separate in many ways from society. But that doesn't change the fact that God loves them and that he revealed himself to them and through them. And as the people of God, we should love and appreciate them. Amen. You know, many of the Christians that get so into the whole Israel thing, uh, they turn off some other Christians because they give the impression that you have to kind of become a Jew to, to follow Jesus, and that's not true. And, um, and so, you know, loving and appreciate them, uh, appreciating them is, is, is one thing, but here, when the Holy Spirit came on them, they prayed in other tongues, and for Peter, that was the sign that there was, he said, can we forbid water? And, um, and so we see the first Gentile converts, and um, um, praying in tongues was seen as indisputable evidence of God's acceptance and salvation of the Gentiles. Acts chapter 10, 47, can anyone forbid to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? And Acts chapter 11, Peter defends what he did um, by you know, acknowledging that they had received the Holy Spirit and prayed in, in other tongues. And so in light of this, I want to ask if we have neglected or ignored this heavenly gift. So exactly what do we need to know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I've just three things and I'm gonna quickly go through them because I think it's important for us to understand. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, number one, brings empowerment. We're called to be a powerful, victorious church, not a defeated one. And this is why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm tired of people saying, oh, Christians, oh, the world is dark and it's getting darker. Oh, the devil's taking over everything. No, he's not. We are. The Bible says we're members of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And so if everything is being shaken, whether nations or governments or, you know, institutions, we must remember, no matter what is being shaken, we are members of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Come on. Acts, uh, Luke 19, 13, it says, occupy till I come. The master said, occupy till I come. The new King James says, do business till I come. Let me tell you something. We're here to do business today in Jesus' name. We're here to do business with God. We're here to do business for the kingdom. That's why he still has us on this earth and not up in heaven. Amen? And so God has given us his power so that we can take the land. Numbers chapter 13 and verse 30 says, we are well able to take the land. I, I love that. I remember years ago there was that old charismatic song, we are well able, we are well able, we are well able to possess the land. I feel sorry for some of you that never went through the charismatic move. It was a lot of fun. I was at the tail, the tail end of it in the early 90s. But, um, you know, numbers, <laughs> they didn't have a lot of knowledge, but you know what, they were, they were loose. They were, they, sometimes I look at people today and they're like, oh, 
It's, it's awful. It's awful. It's so dark. Oh, the, the Antichrist, the devil, and the, oh my God, look, look at what they're doing now. Oh, look at what they're doing. Oh, don't be like. <laughs> there should be joy in the presence of God. When you see these things happening, look up. Hallelujah. Your redemption draws nigh. So, <laughs> at least I made somebody laugh. Um, Numbers 13 and verse 30, and it says, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let's go up at once and take possession of it, for we are well able to overcome. You're well able to overcome. Jesus said, Luke 10, 19, I give you power to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. So drop the pathetic, fatalistic nonsense that there's nothing we can do. We have been given power, but it's no use if we don't use it. Think, think of how everything in your home grinds to a halt during a power cut. All of the various machines and appliances that make your life easier are suddenly useless because no power, no progress. And maybe this explains why we've made so little progress in winning our world. Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. That word endued is in the sense of sinking into a garment. It means to invest with clothing, to array, to clothe with, to endue, to have put on. And so, um, that is that word, endued. Um, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. Um, Acts chapter 3 and verse 12. So when Peter saw it, he responded, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Why look so intently as though by our own power, our godliness, we have made this man walk. So the, the miracles were happening because of the power of God. Acts chapter four and verse um, 33. And uh, it says, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace uh, was upon them all. Acts chapter six and verse eight. And Stephen, full of faith and power. Every one of those verses I just read is in the Greek, it's dunamis. And it's where we get the word dynamite from. And so that word dunamis, our power, means force. It means uh, uh, miraculous power um, or a miracle itself. It means ability, abundance. It means might, mightily, mighty deed. It means a worker of miracles. It means power, strength, violence, mighty, wonderful work. So when Jesus said, you shall receive power, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And, and this is why, again, uh, as the church, we need to walk in the power of God. So God promises us power. And again, it's where we get the word dynamite from. Amen? So God promises us power through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Power to live holy. When I see a, a man say, I can't resist porn. I can't resist only fans. I, I can't. I, I just not I can do, Pastor. Just, yes, there is. Get full of the Holy Ghost. And that devil will leave you in Jesus' name. He'll give you power to live holy. He'll give you power to say no. Oh, Pastor, I just can't say no to him. He's so fine. And he's full of the devil. Come on. I see Christians going back and back like a boomerang to these toxic relationships that are going nowhere. You need to get full of the Holy Spirit. He's a Holy Spirit. The key is in his name. You get full of him, you're going to start living a holy life. Is it okay if I finish this message today? I still have quite a bit to say. This is an important subject. And who knows? The whole world could end before this day is out anyway. So let's just enjoy church. Amen. No, it's not. That's not how it's, the Bible says it's going to end. So chill. Amen? <laughs> power. God promises us power. Power to live holy. Power to love. Power to lift, power to preach, 
Power to deliver. Power to set the captives free. And maybe the reason why we're not seeing the, desire, the, the results that we so desire is because we're trying to do it with natural means. Because it's both sin and folly to be endued with supernatural power that we never use. So use it or lose it. Matthew eleven twelve, 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. You see, passivity or timidity is not a fruit of the Spirit. God gave us power for a reason. He gave us power for this final hour. So you don't have to be afraid about, uh, you know, so many things that are happening in the world right now. If he brought you to it, he's going to bring you through it. No matter what comes. We can face the future with confidence and assurance. God has given us power. The modern church is a bit like... A man who, when asked to move a mountain, ignores all the huge earth-moving equipment and explosive, uh, explosives that are made available to him and won't even pick up a shovel and instead takes a spoon. How many of you know that man may be sincere, but he's sincerely deceived? And that is the way much of the church is operating today. They are sincere, but they do not have the power of God. And consequently, they are not seeing the results that God has promised. And, and they hide behind excuses. Oh, it's the end times. There'll be a great falling away. Well, maybe the reason why people aren't coming is because you're not giving the right message. Maybe people aren't drawn because they don't see the power of God working in your life or your ministry. 1 Samuel 10 and verse 6. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily. And you will prophesy with them. And you will be changed into another man. The disciples are a good example of the transformative power of the infilling of the Spirit. You will be changed into another man, into another woman. And we're not talking about doing some crazy trans stuff through whatever, okay? If you're a man, you're going to be turned into another man, okay? Let's just make that clear. The disciples are a good example of the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, Mark 15, 40, they all forsook him and fled. We tend to focus on Peter's denial, but in reality, they had all failed him. They were all afraid. John 20, 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Then the disciples were glad, and when they saw the Lord, and Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. It says he breathed on them, they received the Holy Spirit. And yet we see there was a subsequent experience in Acts chapter 2. Well, uh, how did they receive the Spirit here? Why? They received salvation. It was only here that they were saved. So don't judge Peter or the other disciples too harshly. At the end of the day, they were doing the best they could, but they weren't born again during the Gospels until Jesus breathed the Spirit on them. And so every person who receives Jesus as their Savior receive a measure of the Holy Spirit. However, there's a subsequent experience, as we see in Acts 2, where the Spirit of God came on them and they prayed in other tongues hopefully that clarifies something for you but this is the thing the disciples were afraid until they discovered that Jesus was alive and so they gathered to pray Acts chapter 1 and to worship and to wait on God that's what we're going to be doing next Saturday I encourage you you know everybody clapped when the poster came up but I hope you're going to do more than just clap you're going to come and you're going to pray next Saturday right here amen Please, let other Christians know. I believe there's power in corporate prayer. But they gathered to pray and to wait on God. But then the fire fell and everything, and I mean everything, changed. They were filled with a boldness that they never had before. The church burst on the scene. And the very same men who had once cowered in fear were filled with a holy boldness. They had been changed. What might happen if we were filled with the same Holy Spirit? 
Because we are. And this is why, again, we must understand, we must not hinder or grieve or ignore the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you're sealed to the day of redemption. And so, if you have been filled, you have been empowered. And so use it for God's glory. You see, we have been changed to go change our world. Remember, it's about souls, not goosebumps. Amen? It's about eternity. It's about reaching people for Christ. It's about souls. It's not about goosebumps. This is why many Christians get a completely wrong perspective of what the Holy Spirit, ooh, I felt something there. Oh, that was so lovely. (laughs) It's not about feelings. You can get all the, feelings not gonna change your life. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and I can tell somebody's filled with the Holy Spirit, I'll see him on the street on a Saturday. She said, you should receive power after you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you shall be witnesses to me. Are you a witness for Jesus Christ? Are you doing something to reach others for Jesus Christ? Are you sharing your faith with others? Are you actively involved in reaching your world for Jesus Christ? Because every week when I, I, I stand in that street, it just breaks my heart because I see so many sad people So many people who are empty, who are discouraged looking, who are just so lost looking. I say, Lord, please bring that awakening to our city. Bring that awakening to our nation in Jesus' name. You see, when God fills your heart, he changes you, he moves you, and he'll give you a burden for a lost and a dying world in Jesus' name. Amen? And so, um, Jeremiah 20 verse 9, but if I say I will not mention his word or speak anymore in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire. Like a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it back. Indeed, I cannot. Because a man or a woman on fire is literally unstoppable. What do we say about, 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 you you know, when a sportsman or a soccer player is is doing a really great job, we say that, that they're on fire. Well, you know, when God sets you on fire, you bring change. Um, John Wesley said this, light yourself on fire with passion and people will come from miles to watch you burn. You see, God has fully empowered and equipped us as his representatives. 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We appeal, uh, we, we speak for Christ when we say, come back to God. And so God has equipped us that we are his ambassadors, we are his representatives. And so don't complain about the fact I'm the only Christian in my job. Praise the Lord. God has chosen you for for, for you to represent him there. What a privilege. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Oh, praise God. If you could stand to your feet today. I don't think I'm going to finish it. <sighs> praise God. Could you just lift your hands to the Lord right now as the worship group come forward? Father, we just thank you for your presence here today in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, that in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Lord, we want... I don't know about you, but I'm hungry to see more. I want to go beyond where we've been. I'm grateful for what we have, but I know God has so much more in store for us as the church of Jesus Christ. But we have to be hungry enough, amen? We have to be hungry enough to press in and to seek his face. And that's one reason why we're having that day of prayer next week is we want to gather and bring men and women, intercessors from all around this country to gather and pray and stand in the gap. Because you know what, looking at what's happening in the world, if you're not going to pray at this stage, you're never going to pray. If after what you saw in COVID and everything that's come since, if, if, if you don't have a hunger for prayer, I'm telling you something, there's something seriously wrong with your, your Christianity. We need to be people of prayer. We need to be people who are seeking his face. You know, the Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. You know, our land needs to be healed. You know, we have so many kids growing up without a daddy. We have so many, you know, people that are living in poverty, so many people that are homeless, so many people that are suicidal, so many people that are addicted. 
You know, I was just talking to a lady yesterday and just said, you know, it just breaks my heart, you know, because I came to Dublin in 1992. And, you know, back then there were so many people from the inner city who were addicted, you know, whether alcohol or drugs. And, you know, so many of those young people have died. Fact is, I mean, there's a whole generation that's been wiped out through drugs, through addiction, not just in our inner cities, but throughout our cities, throughout our towns, throughout our villages. And, um, you know, as the church, we need to get on our knees and pray for our generation. And, um, but I believe things can change. God has promised that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And so, you know, today I only dealt with the whole area of empowerment. God has empowered us. He has empowered us to be his witnesses. He has empowered us by his Holy Spirit. And so, in a few moments, I'm going to open the altars for those who would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because you might say, I'm a Christian, but I don't have the power of God in my life. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but I don't have that power that you speak about. I'm, I'm, uh, maybe you're defeated by addiction or by, you know, your past or by, uh, you know, some secret sin, or, or maybe it's just the fact that you're conscious, you're, con- you're conscious that you don't have the power uh, of God working in your life. You know, you want to be able to share your faith, but you can't. Let me tell you something, the Holy Spirit is the key. You cannot do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at Peter, before he received the Holy Spirit and afterwards, he was transformed. Amen. And this is the promise we have is that, you know, that, that uh, you, you, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. But before we do that, I want to give you an opportunity with every head bowed, every eye closed. The Lord's in this place. I've done my best to, to preach the gospel to you and to give it to you as straight as I can because, you know, Jesus is coming back. This is not a time to be playing games with him. Peter said he's going to be the judge of the living and the dead. You're not going to be able to hide behind the religious label saying I'm this, I'm that, or I'm the other. Religion does not cut it. Jesus said you must be born again. And I want, to, I want you to search your heart right now and ask yourself that question. Am I ready to stand before my creator? Are you ready to stand before the God who gave breath into your lungs? The God who put that fingerprint on your fingers? That God who saw you and knew you and knit you together when you were in your mother's womb? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you have peace with God? The Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the glory of the gospel is that we can have that assurance, not just in life, but even in death. We can have that assurance that heaven is our home and Jesus is our Lord. And so if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, but today you would like to receive this new life of which I've been speaking, because God can give you a new life. It does not matter where you've been or what you've done or how you have failed. He loves you. And he proved that love by dying on the cross. And so if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, if you've never accepted him as your savior, put your hand up and I'm gonna pray with you today. God bless you, sir, I see that hand. Is there anybody else here today? You wanna surrender your life to Jesus? You're ready to say yes to him. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is moving in this place. I know that, I sense that. So please don't resist them. If you know you're not right with God, but today you would like to be saved, just put your hand up high and I'm going to pray with you as well today. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. But like any gift, you have to reach out and take it. And so if you know you're not saved, if you know you're not ready to stand before your creator, please, this isn't about embarrassing you, but don't resist the Holy Spirit of God. Say yes to Jesus Christ. If you're not right with him, I see that hand. God bless you, sir. Praise the Lord, young man, I spoke to you yesterday on the street. Glory to Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Your life is going to change today. All you have to do is say yes to Jesus Christ. Make him your Lord. Make him your Savior. So if you've never surrendered to Jesus, just one last time. 
This is, I know there's a lot of people here, but ultimately this is about you and God. If you're not right with him, but you want to be, if you've never asked Christ into your heart, you can do it right now. Just put your hand up high and I'm going to pray for you as well. Could those of you put your hand up, just come down here and I'm going to pray with you in Jesus' name. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Come on over here. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Praise the Lord. You just stand there. Amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, give her an encouragement as she comes forward. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God bless you. God bless you, little Ruth. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, from the Ukraine. God bless you. Italy. Oh, praise the Lord. God bless you. I'm so happy you are here today. Praise the Lord. Amen. Just stretch your hands towards them today. Just before we pray, if there's anybody else, don't resist the Spirit of God. If you know you're meant to be down here, maybe you've been intimidated or afraid, just ask your friend to come forward with you and, and, and we'll, we'll pray with you. But please, if you know you're not right with the Lord, this is your moment to respond and say yes to Jesus Christ. Because I believe this is about eternity. I believe this message is the truth. I don't labor this every week because I'm, I'm, I'm looking to have people at the altar, but I want to make sure if you're not saved, if you're not right with the King, please come forward before we pray. Thank you, Jesus. Could you just look at me and just pray this simple prayer? The Lord loves you. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, young man. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you, young lady. Praise the Lord. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. I want you all to just stay here for a moment, just in the presence of the Lord. Oh, Father, we thank you, Jesus. I want you to just put your eyes on the Lord right now. Could we just sing that chorus for a moment, and then we're going to pray with you in Jesus' name.